So when the neural pathways atrophy through lack of use, is that because of lack of stimulation? Yeah, so the way that neurons, neurons are what send signals to the brain and to other parts of the body. And all those neural pathways need to be active in order for our brain to tell our arms and legs what to do. And then our senses send neurochemical signals to our brain to tell our brain, you just touch something hot or you smell food or hey, there's a potential mate over there. If those pathways are not being used, then the synapses, which connect these neurons together, atrophy and just fall away. And so now you don't have maybe anything firing between, um, let's say, the part of the brain that would regulate climbing or is associated with climbing and the ability to climb. So you could have a tree in front of a snake and they don't know what to do with it because that neural pathway is kaput. And, it's, and unfortunately what happens sometimes under captive management when they don't have enough environmental complexity and stimulation, when they don't have outlets for this higher functioning, um, that all that's firing are those fear centers. And the amygdala is highly involved with fear learning and fear acquisition. And the hippocampus is highly involved with suppressing that and regulating that. But what happens if you aren't stimulating the hippocampus to do problem solving and to cognitively um, think about tasks and giving the brain things to do, then it is sitting there atrophying and those synapses aren't firing. And the ones that are firing constantly are the ones in the amygdala that are telling the animal, I'm afraid. And you can acquire a generalized fear or reactivity now of everything. So now the animal's fearful out of context. So maybe initially they were afraid when they should have been. It was a legitimate, oh man, this person opened the drawer and startled me and it scared me and that's appropriate. But now, because that's the only interaction they're having, it's the only activity they get, they're not getting to use the other brain areas the fear center is just going crazy. And now they're generalizing that fear to everything. So now it's not just when the drawer opens, it's when they get taken out, it's when they get taken to the vet, it's when something else happens because the most active part of the brain are the synapses that are involved in fear or reactivity. And that's just an example. You know, If you give the snake things to do constantly where they're constantly climbing or swimming or burrowing or um, figuring out how to get out of their enclosure, those are the synapses that are firing all the time. And those are the ones that are continued to grow and build branches. And the ones um, involved in fear acquisition and fear learning aren't getting utilized. And so those are the ones that are going to become diminished. So the more choice rich life an animal has, the more resiliency they build, the more challenging experiences that they can encounter in their lifetime and be successful at, the more confident the animal is going to be and the less overall fearful they're going to be. And the opposite, of course, happens if you don't give them those opportunities, because all they have to do is think about sitting in that box and how scared of everything they are. And cognitive bias also impacts animals. So cognitive bias is, do you have a more pessimistic or optimistic outlook on the world? So if I put a snake in a room with lots to do, is the snake gonna ask itself, what's gonna happen to me here? What can this environment do to me? Or is the snake going to ask itself, oh, what can I do in this environment? I wonder what will happen if I go climb on this. I wonder what will happen if I push this with my nose. I wonder what will happen if I get in that water. I wonder what will happen if I eat this. That's an example of a pessimistic outlook or an optimistic one right from the get go. And we can foster that by the way that we raise the animals. You can foster a more optimistic outlook, which is that animal that's going to be placed in a room or that human that's going to be placed in a new environment and think, oh, I wonder what I can do here versus, oh my gosh, I wonder what's going to happen to me here. But if no one's you know really realizing that, that is likely to go to a zoo or to a home with like a pet home or an education program, or that snake that you're raising in the rack is likely to go to a situation where it's going to be handled, it's going to be around people, it's gonna have environmental complexity. 
and it's going to see the environment at large. You're not doing it any favors by not preparing it for that life in the beginning. If you know all the snakes ever gonna go to is another breeder, I mean, it's sad and unfortunate, but you're preparing it to do well and thrive with another breeder. If you're raising it in a rack with nothing else. But if you know that your snakes are likely to go to these other situations, but you're not doing anything to prepare it to deal with or cope with those other situations, then you're putting it in a bad spot because it's gonna get into these other situations. And if people don't transition it slowly and gradually, it's gonna be in shock because change is stressful. And if all it's ever known is one thing and you put it in a situation that is completely the opposite, whichever way you're doing that, it's gonna be stressful. It is going to be stressful for the animal and some will cope better than others depending on how much innate resiliency they have to change. Some are gonna cope extremely poorly and never not do well at all. Some are gonna bounce back relatively quickly. And that that's all determined by genetics and resiliency and a whole bunch of other factors too. But yes, you're not, you need to raise the animal to succeed in the life that it's likely to find itself in. And if you're not sure what that is, then the best thing we can do for the animal, whether it's a horse or a dog or a snake or whatever, is prepare them for everything we could think of that they might encounter later in life. It's going to make for an animal that copes better with change and is more resilient. It's almost like a, a self-fulfilling so cycle where in a situation which offers them no stimulation, they obviously aren't becoming more adaptable and more resilient. And then that is being observed as, well, actually... They stress when they come out of these racks, so the rack's better. So it almost feeds back into itself. And it's like a false observation of the rack is more appropriate when in reality the rack, or I keep saying rack, but any unstimulating environment is causing the problem in the first place. Yes, you've raised the animal to succeed in that environment. You haven't raised the animal to succeed in other environments. You, the keeper, the breeder, whoever is caring for that animal, the caretaker, has raised that animal to succeed in the environment it's in. And if it goes to a different environment, it's going to have difficulty coping. It's gonna have transition stress. And whether it succeeds in that new environment or not is, is now on the shoulders of the new keeper and how they facilitate that transition. And the older the animal is, the more difficult it's gonna to be to do that. If I got um, a couple of whorls at three, four weeks old from racks, and they had no, they were transitioned within a few days. I mean, the experience they had prior to coming here was negligible compared to the experience they've had here because three weeks is nothing. Like, I don't even know if in the wild if they would have left their little hatching area too far yet at three weeks old. So I'm taking them at this very young age with hardly any prior life experience and I'm starting to put them in environmental stimulation and they're doing great. I've also taken five and six year old royals that have known only rats and the transition is long and hard because they only ever knew that rack. That is what they were raised to succeed in. And now I'm trying to transition them into more complexity and it is distressing for them. And so I start out by keeping them very simplistically and gradually exposing them to more and more stimulation. And sometimes they, their brain has been dormant for so long. All their brain has been used for is to drink and eat and uh, breed usually. So sometimes they'll sit next to an open door for hours, days. They don't even understand that they can come out the door. And so then I have to facilitate that a little bit and show them that you can come out and it's a long process. It's difficult because all they've ever known is the is the tub. And they're five and six years old now. And that's a long learning history of tub life. And it's very challenging to adapt to something new. They can adapt. They are adapting. But if you're getting a pet from that kind of history, you, you've got to have no expectations and realize it could take like one I've been working with um, going on two years now. So, I mean, I'm not 
it's working. He's, he's showing more behavioral diversity. He's learning to target train. I just filmed a session with him last night, but that did not happen overnight. I mean, I think it took him seven months before he understood that he could come out the door when it was open. This video was but a section of a larger interview with Laurie Torini. So if you like this sort of content and the level of science and detail that Laurie's going into, you can find the full length episode and much more information right here.